all this stuff was cut out and cute, but I think they're missing the mark. I would have named it Booty Call Nightclub Wear by GNA. That would sell like hotcakes. Yes, girl! Woo! Oh, I love the bag! Uh hey, guys. Welcome back to my channel. It's your girl, the Brooke Ashley, and today we are here to discuss The Real Housewives of Potomac, Season 8, Episode 17. And before we jump into it, let me just say we are almost at the finish line. Next week is the finale episode. Thank God, won't he do it? Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. But what happened at the end of this episode, I said, this is a hot mess. Ashley, you are so low down to encourage Deborah because that's what it felt like. It felt like a setup. Because the minute Ashley says, are the cameras down? Have we finished filming? All of a sudden, Deborah walks over to Candace to start a fight. So it's like, yeah, you set that up and we're tired. And shame on production for cramming all these other storylines in the second to last episode because this episode felt like they were just jamming everything in. Y'all, Potomac is all over the place. I've made peace with the fact that I don't think it's ever going to get back to normal again. And it is what it is. So without further ado, let's just jump right on into it because you guys already know that we don't have a minute to spare. We open up this episode with NECA and Ike. They're at a fertility center. And I'm gonna be honest with you guys, we can breeze right past this because I don't care. And is it just me or does it seem like NECA is always annoyed by her husband? She never talks to him in a pleasant tone. She always talks to him with that slight edge in her voice, like she's aggravated and irritated with him. And I don't care to see either one of them. They're not interesting. Now we jump over to Mia and Gordon. They're having a therapy session. And if I'm being honest with you, I can't take Mia seriously because we already know that present day, she's dating somebody else. And in this scene, she looks so checked out. Gordon's trying to talk to her and she just looks like she'd rather be anywhere else but there. But anyhow, the therapist is asking them, where are they now in their marriage? How have things been since the word divorce was thrown out? So Gordon says that divorce was never his consideration. And now Mia says she only did it because Gordon was very combative. He was combative with her, their kids, their partners. And a quick side note, who are these partners? I thought that Gordon and Mia got kicked out of the family business. So who are these partners that you guys are speaking of? I'm so confused to hear it. I'm like, Mia talks out two sides of her face. I never know what's the truth. Well, none of us know the truth because we know that Mia lies. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to know, who are these imaginary partners? <laughs> now we learned that the first time Mia told Gordon that she wanted a divorce, Gordon emptied out her bank account and said, you're not going anywhere. So Mia says, isn't that abusive? Because no man or woman should be able to do that. Now, like I said, when it comes to Mia, we don't know what the truth is. There's a part of me that thinks that everything out of her mouth is a lie. So I don't know if I believe that Gordon emptied out her bank account. And also you being married to a man almost 40 years older and you're not attracted to him. I do not believe for one minute that you don't have a secret account. And every woman knows and was told to always have a secret account that your man does not know about. So again, Mia, I don't know if I believe this. <laughs> <laughs> so now the therapist is asking them how's the intimacy in their marriage. Gordon says that he thinks that it's fine. And Mia's like, um, how do you define intimacy? Because when it comes to Gordon, he's not really the romantic type. And I've made peace with that, but he doesn't romance me the way I feel he should. Gordon was not here for Mia throwing him under the bus and making it out like he's a horrible partner. He says, Mia, romance means different things to different people. And by the way, sis, you don't romance me either. He says that every time they're in bed, he's trying to cuddle with her and he tries to touch her and kiss her and Mia's on her phone. He goes on to say that she treats him like he has the plague. I said, damn, Mia couldn't even deny it. And I said, Gordon, that's what happens when you marry a woman who's that much younger than you and you run out of money. 
she was only with you for the money. It was not because of your looks, like, and it's no shade, but are you really surprised that she's treating you like she just is repulsed by you? But Gordon, I don't have any sympathy because that's what you get. You were cheating on your third wife with Mia and then you left her for Mia, so, I don't feel a way about it. So Mia says that a lot of things have gone down the past few years with her health scare, them getting kicked out of the family business, financial hardship. So it's been rough. And I said, girl, don't bring in that fake health scare. That was only for a plot line, so don't do that. One thing about Mia, Mia is going to keep up a storyline to stay on this show. So now the therapist makes them do this exercise where they have to hold hands and look each other in the eyes. And Gordon says, I just want you to communicate with me and not make me feel like I'm an afterthought. And honestly, I feel like we have one of the best marriages ever. I said, Gordon, who are you trying to fool? And the way Mia looked at you, she said, Negro, please, I'm about to divorce you. <laughs> I don't have a whole lot to say about Candace and her therapy scene with her discussing wanting to have a child but being scared. Honestly, that's up to Candace to figure out. I think that she does want to have children. She's just too scared and she feels like if she has a kid and takes time away from her career, then her career might not be there. That's what I think is happening. So now we jump to a group scene that was courtesy of Mia because she wants all the women to join her in this photo shoot. We find out that a few days prior, the founder of Monarch Magazine reached out to Mia saying that he wanted Mia and the rest of the women on the show to do this photo shoot for the magazine to showcase all these trailblazers and icons. So they're all going to be dressed up as famous black women. So we see that Candace was selected to be Diana Ross. Wendy was selected to be Cheryl Lee Ralph. Giselle has been chosen to be Beyonce. Karen is going to be Lena Horne. Ashley is going to be Dorothy Dandridge. And Mia is going to be Pam Greer. Now a quick side note. One of y'all made a great point on Twitter about how it was apparent that Ashley had no idea who Dorothy Dandridge was because her response was a bit telling. I said, Ashley, you don't know who she was. I said, girl, you can stop because it was so fake. She's like, oh my gosh, Dorothy Dandridge, I'm so excited. And I said, do you know anything about her? Probably not. <laughs> oh my gosh, I forgot about Robin. Robin was selected to be Mariah Carey. So here is where it gets shady. They all ask about NECA. They're like, okay, so what about her? Who is she going to be? Is she a part of this photo shoot? And Mia says, well, here's the thing. I asked about NECA and they said that they don't know enough about her to participate in this photo shoot. And now we see a clip that Mia and NECA went out to lunch and Mia relayed the news that she won't be a part of it. And Naka says, it's okay, you guys have fun. So here's where Mia breaks the fourth wall and she says, let's be real here. They all know us from the Real Housewives of Potomac and Neca just got here. Sorry, maybe next time. I said, oop. I said, now Mia, girl, you just got here yourself. You joined in season six. So now you wanna act like you're an OG and you've been here for all these years. You see how people do you? It's so funny how people want to leave somebody else out when they just got in somewhere themselves. Karen had me screaming. She said, oh, okay. So you guys crowned her the new grand dame and she's not even in this photo shoot. <laughs> <laughs> this right here shows me that NECA probably won't be asked back for season nine because she has not made her mark at all. I really think that she's going to be a one and done. Now we jump on over to Robin. She's with Juan and they're both looking at location spaces for her new business venture. We remember earlier in this season, she was discussing opening up a franchise of Glow 30 and we find out that it's a membership facial studio. So they're looking at spaces. They look at this one place, I think is 1,600 square feet. And I think that the rent came out to 68,000 a year. And Robin's like, that's actually not bad. And I will say that the space definitely looked nice. And I think that Robin might have a success on her hands. 
Say what you want about Robin, and you guys know that I give Robin the business every single episode, but I will always give credit where credit is due. I do think that Robin is very business savvy. We saw how well her hat business did. Also, her having celebrity and a name, that will also draw people into her business. So yeah, I could definitely see Robin's business doing really well. So now we see Robin and Juan talking, and Juan's giving her some encouragement. He says that this is a big deal. He can envision all of this. Then he makes a joke saying that he could actually run this location. So now we see Robin saying her confessional that this business is a way to have some stability, especially since Juan has lost his job. She doesn't want to have to worry about depending on an employer and she wants to create different income streams. Now that's great. I think that it's awesome to have different streams of income. But here's my thing. What is Juan doing to make sure that you guys are stable financially? Why is this all on you? And y'all know how I feel. I don't like the idea of women being the breadwinner. I always think that it's a recipe for disaster when the woman is bringing home all the money and the man isn't. I think that for several reasons, that's a horrible idea. But it just seems like Robin's putting too much pressure on herself to make sure that they're financially stable instead of Juan. Juan is a grown ass man. He's your husband. And if he wants to be the provider and the protector, he should be the one busting his ass to make sure that you guys are good. Another reason why I feel like this relationship is one sided, where Robin, in my opinion, likes and loves him more than he likes and loves her. Because if Robin were his dream girl, he would be busting his ass to make sure that they were good financially. He would not even want Robin to lift a finger and worry about how things are going to get paid. Y'all, again, it might be a reach, but personally, I feel like if you're the one who has to worry about the money and how you guys are going to get money, I feel like that man does not like you because a man who likes you and really wants you to be good, he's not letting you worry about that. He's going to lighten your load. If that means that he has to work seven jobs, he'll do that to make sure that you have a good life. But again, I digress. So now Robin says to Juan, did you know that Giselle's dealing with a lot? Her dad's in the hospital right now. And now she calls Giselle up to check on her and see how she's doing. So Robin's asking her, how is she doing? And Giselle says that she's hanging in there. And now we see the producer ask Giselle, what's going on with her dad? And Giselle says, we'll talk about that later. Now, I've said this before in several other recaps regarding prior seasons. Giselle has a very hard time being vulnerable. And that's another reason why I feel like she holds the show back. Because you're here to talk about your life. And every response can't be, well, let's talk about that later. And people were saying, well, you don't know how you would feel if you haven't been through it. I've been through it. My dad was a young man and he passed away from cancer three years ago. So <laughs> I understand completely. Yes, it is hard. It does suck. But if you are on a show, if you are on a public platform, you do owe it to your viewers to disclose a little bit of what's happening. That's why you are on the show. And that's not fair that Giselle gets to skate by with every facet of her life and not share. If you watch Beverly Hills, then you know that I got on Kyle because Kyle pulled this same stunt this entire season. I just don't like how these women will get on these shows, they collect these checks, and then they want to say, well, I don't want to talk about that, not right now. Well, if you don't want to talk about what's going on in your life, then it might be time for you to find another job because that's not going to cut it. But we do find out from Robin that Giselle had told her that her father has brain cancer. Again, it would have been nice if Giselle would have shared that with us herself versus us having to hear that secondhand from her best friend. Just my humble opinion. This next scene with Wendy shooting her pilot episode for her talk show, I loved every second of it. She got some heavy hitters out. She had the April Ryan, who's a White House correspondent for the Grio there. She had Jasmine from the Jasmine brand. She had Lindsey Granger. And then she had the CEO and the founder of Black Girls Vote. 
the pilot episode looked like money. I was here for every second of it. I said, Dr. Wendy, that is how you do it. And we saw the day before that Eddie had cut Wendy a check for $50,000 because they had gone over budget. I said, I know that's right. I said, we love to see it. I said, he wrote that check just as smoothly as he did. It wasn't even a problem. He just said, here you go, babe. I said, that's why these other ladies are mad because their men could never. Bling, bling, bling. Bitches is mad. <laughs> They're giving their men money. See, Robin and Juan. And Giselle, well, she's dating somebody almost 20 years younger who does not even, I don't think, has that much money. But anyhow, I digress. Y'all know Dr. Wendy is my girl and I love her down. I'm proud of her. It was nice that we actually saw the behind the scenes of her filming the show. I loved it because this entire season, they have really done her so wrong in times of airtime. We have only seen Wendy in group settings. Her solo scenes, we're getting like five seconds of her. So to see her get a full three to four minutes, I loved it. I said, exactly. So now it's the day of Giselle and Ashley's GNA photo shoot. So we see them at the venue getting their hair and makeup done. And when Giselle gets there, she says, Ashley, I just want to say thank you so much for stepping it up because she's been back and forth from Florida, visiting her dad in the hospital. And Ashley really took over and did a great job. So we see Karen arrive first. Karen had me screaming. She said this year, Giselle has been improving with her fashions and she's hopeful that GNA will actually look like something. Now, Karen, don't hold your breath. And like we saw later on, the fashions looked a hot mess. Now, I know we get on Giselle about her fashions, but we can't forget Ashley because I think that Ashley dresses the worst out of everybody. Ashley cannot dress worth a damn. If we're being honest, the vast majority of this cast can't dress, so not too much from anybody. The only people who can dress, Karen, Wendy and Candace. And Karen, we remember your dated fashions from the first three seasons. So you are definitely most improved, but don't act like you weren't once where Giselle was because girl, season one, those looks were a mess. <laughs> we do see Karen and Giselle talk. Karen's asking Giselle how she's doing. And Giselle says, yeah, it's been hard. And Karen says, I know, but if you need anything, I'm here. One thing about Karen, Karen definitely is there for the ladies if they are having a hard time, especially when it comes to parents. We know that Karen lost both of her parents in season three, so she has a soft spot for people who are dealing with the same thing. So I really did like the fact that Karen said, if you need anything, let me know, I got you. Now, Sharice, all the money that you have from your divorce settlement, I don't understand why you refuse to step up the fashions. Sharice is on the same level as Giselle when it comes to style because that dress that she showed up in, I said, Sharice, that's the best you could do. That dress was so shapeless. I, I just said, you know what, Sharice, I'm not surprised at all that they won't ask you back to be full time because you can't get it together. The wigs always look like they're plopped on your head. I'm like, do you not go to a hair salon? Cherise should have the best wigs and weaves with the money that she has. And she refuses to get them done. They look crazy. They look like Karen's old wigs in the first two seasons. Remember how Karen's wigs started from all the way back here? <laughs> Again, I will always give credit where credit is due. Robin looked really good. I love the hair, that all white. I said, come through. I said, Robin, if you could keep this look all the time, you'd be golden. Because Robin has her moments where she really hits it out of the park and then other times not so much. But this outfit, I said, yes, ma'am. I thought Giselle's dress could have been a lot better. I mean, it was okay. It was a black dress but it just looked like it was too short for her. I don't know, I don't know. 
I feel like for your fashion show, you should look amazing because this is your night. I think that Ashley's look, that was her best look to date. The hair was flawless. Those Prada clips, I said, yes, ma'am. Now, I hope they were real because we all know that Ashley loves a fake. But I think that that was Ashley's best look. The dress was actually cute. I said, okay. I said, all right, Ashley. I'm gonna give you three points for that. <laughs> Mia, Jacqueline, and NECA arrive. I thought that NECA's dress was the best that we've seen from her this entire season. It was actually cute. I said, thank God she did not show up in one of those unflattering two-piece short sets because I would have screamed. <laughs> Ashley's mom, Sheila's there. She came in with her new wig. I said, come through, Sheila, give us a new look. <laughs> she gave us a new cut, a new color. <laughs> I thought that Candace looked amazing, very sexy. That dress, those platforms, the Dior purse, I said, come through. Wendy looked really good. And I loved how she was such a class act. She goes over to Ashley and Giselle's right there and she congratulates them both. She says, oh my gosh, Ashley, this is so exciting. I'm so proud of you. And then she turns to Giselle and says, and Giselle, congratulations. And Giselle does say, I appreciate that. Now here's my thing. Wendy is, I guess, a lot more mature than me because I don't know if I would have been able to say congratulations to somebody who's been so evil to me for the last two years. This is the same woman who walked into Wendy and Eddie's Happy Eddie event just a few weeks ago and did not speak to either one of them. But I will add that I was pleasantly surprised that Giselle actually did acknowledge Wendy giving her well wishes because I thought that Giselle was going to be nasty and petty and turn her head and act like she didn't even hear Wendy. But nice to see that Giselle can be mature when she wants to be. So unfortunately, we have to see Sesame Street again. Oops, I mean Deborah. And production gets me every single time when they played that jump scare music when she popped up on the screen. <laughs> The way Deborah was roasted all last season, you would think that she would have upgraded her style because she looked a mess. That spandex onesie that she was wearing, I said, girl, what is this? But she has the audacity to walk up to Wendy and say hello and give Wendy a hug. Now, Wendy, when you were like, ew, no, like, uh-uh, that's what we call fake. Wendy, I love you and all, but there is no way that I would have hugged Deborah. She would not have even gotten a hello out of me. I would have told Deborah, surely you're not speaking to me after you lied on my husband last year. That wouldn't be happening. So now we see Mia tell the ladies that in two days, she's going to be having a party revealing their pictures from the photo shoot. So Wendy's like, oh my gosh, how did my pictures come out? And she's like, oh girl, you slayed. Now we see the flashbacks of all of them at their photo shoots. And I was pissed because I said, once again, production is playing in our faces. This entire time, we've been seeing the trailers of them showing the photo shoot with Giselle as Beyonce and Candace as Diana Ross. And now for us to only see a two second clip of that, that's unacceptable. You guys tease that scene in every single trailer and now we're only getting a flashback. That's, that's ridiculous. And y'all do that a lot because in season six, you guys are supposed to show us the Telfar collaboration that they did with InStyle Magazine and you guys cut that out. And honestly, we could have seen that in this episode and then for the finale episode next week, we could have closed it out with the fashion show. Again, I feel like the production team needs to be swapped out for another production crew because this ain't it. There were a lot of other things that they could have focused on and they chose to give us the scraps. So the fashion show starts and y'all, these fashions were a hot mess. I said, where is Dwight when you need him? 
I said, it's a sad day when GNA is making She by Sheree actually look like something. Somebody on Twitter said that GNA was so bad, it made She by Sheree look like Louis Vuitton. And I agree. I said, damn, they might as well put She by Sheree and Neiman Marcus the way GNA was so bad. At one point, I said to myself, so Giselle and Ashley looked at these pieces and said, this makes sense. <laughs> I said, this makes sense to y'all. Just a whole bunch of spandex cutouts and polyester going up and down the runway. I said, okay, I guess. Karen said, wait a minute, these are gym clothes. They should have called this nighttime booty call wear by GNA. <laughs> So one of the models was wearing this bodysuit with the cutouts on the side. And Wendy says, uh-uh, remember how I wore something similar when we went to Williamsburg two years ago and they all made fun of me for it saying that, oh, what is she doing? We cut back to the flashback of Giselle saying, well, I'm surprised that a professor is wearing something with her sides out like that. And I said, Wendy, clock it because the way they got on you saying that you were loose and why were you dressing like that? Why are you trying to be sexy? And now they have that same outfit in their line. Candace says, this is a very elevated Alibaba. <laughs> Again, is anybody surprised? This is Giselle and Ashley. The nicest thing I can say about this fashion show, I'm glad that they had an open bar and a full spread because that food looked good. The way Wendy was chomping down on those crab legs, I said, I know that's right. And Neko was just happy to be out filming a scene because you hear her say, oh yeah, this was a fashion show with real fashions. I said, were they real fashions? But then again, sis, you're out here with those horrible two-piece set, so I'm sure you think that GNA looks good. This is right up your alley. So the fashion show is over, and now we see Ashley and Giselle walk out, and they thank everybody for coming. Giselle says that it's been a really troubling time for her, and how she's so happy that Ashley was there to step up. Now, I am fully prepared to tussle with you guys in the comments, because I know that there was a lot of discourse on social media, about this particular scene. We see Mia telling Wendy, Candace, and Karen that Giselle is going through a hard time and how her father is ill and preparing for surgery. So Candace says, I'm sorry to hear that. And now Mia says, well, why don't you say that to Giselle? So Candace says, um, when it comes to certain people, I can wish them well from a distance. So Wendy jumps in and says, well, when my mom was going into surgery and I told you guys, you guys all made fun of me, including her. And that's all I have to say about that. So now you have people on social media saying, oh my gosh, why would Wendy say that? That's just so wrong. That's just so evil. And I said, now let's hold on for a minute. I didn't feel any way about Wendy saying that because we can go down the list of all the horrible things that Giselle has said. Giselle sat on that couch at the season seven reunion and said verbatim, I do not like Wendy, so I do not care that she was assaulted by Mia. So now Wendy has to be the bigger person because Giselle is going through something. That's not how this works. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. The same way Giselle has made it clear that she does not like Wendy, does not care about Wendy, would not piss on Wendy if she were on fire, then Wendy's not in the wrong if she gives her that same energy by saying, hey, she didn't show me any empathy when I was going through something, so why should I show her empathy? Do you guys remember in season six? And we found out that Wendy's daughter, Cameron, her baby daughter, I have to add, who was only like two at the time, was in the ICU because she was sick, and Giselle did not even reach out to her or send her any well wishes. She didn't say, I hope your daughter gets well. I'm so sorry to hear that. It shouldn't be on Wendy to always be the bigger person every single time. She didn't speak ill of Giselle, didn't speak ill of her dad. She simply said, well, Giselle has been mean and nasty to me, 
So I don't know why I have to extend grace to her when I haven't gotten it from her. Miss me with all that Wendy was out of line for saying that and how dare she because I can bet money that the vast majority of y'all would have had the same response. Am I lying? So at this point we see them all dancing, they're drinking and toasting. Ashley thanks them for coming. Giselle leaves early because she has to get on a plane to go back and see her dad. So here's where things get messy and violent and out of control. And Ashley, I blame you for this. And I still think that you set this whole thing up. We see Deborah lurking in the shadows. And now we hear Ashley say, are the cameras down yet? Have we finished filming? And so we see that at 9.56, the cameras went down, but their mics were still on. So again, at this point, the cameras are down. We can't see anything, but we hear everything. Deborah walks over to Candace and we hear her say, Candace, do you and I need to talk about anything? And Candace says, nope, absolutely not. Get the help away from me. Why is the help talking to me? So Deborah keeps repeating herself and she's like, but you didn't say any of that in front of my face. Why didn't you say that to my face? And she's referring to Candace calling her Sesame Street. Now we hear Kierna jump in and she's like, that's not the time or the place, like please go away. And she keeps saying, this is not the time or the place, please leave. And then the next thing we know, we hear a whole bunch of screaming and commotion and it's obvious that a fight broke out. So we all remember that before the season even started, we saw the clips of the fight and it was obvious that Deborah did not win. We find out from Dr. Wendy on Watch What Happens Live that Deborah started the entire fight. She threw a drink. Now, let me just say this, Deborah, you are raggedy, you are a loser, and you're a complete weirdo. And I'm so glad that you lost the fight and Kierna whooped that ass because that's what you deserve. How dare you try to pick a fight and confront Candace when one, she wasn't bothering you, she was ignoring you the entire night, you purposely waited until the cameras were down to approach her. That says a lot. It says that you and Ashley were up to no good and that Ashley set you up yet again and she set you up for failure. Also, Deborah, you had ample time to reach out to Candace if you wanted to speak to her and clear the air. And I just want to understand the mentality of Deborah because Deborah, you're in the wrong. You lied on Chris Bassett and Eddie saying that they were trying to hit on you and hit on your friends and they came up to you and they were pushing up on you. You're a liar. So how dare you be mad at Candace because she blasted you calling you Sesame Street. She had every right. You're the one who started with her. I just don't understand the logic that Ashley and her friends have where they think that they can be the villain and the victim. That's not how it works. And I'm glad that Deborah lost the fight and now looks and feels like a dummy because if you go on her Instagram page, she has her comments locked up. I'm sure you do because you know that you were dead ass wrong to approach Candace in the first place. If I were Candace, I would be suing you because you're not going to sit up here and assault me. I didn't do anything to you. You're the one who started with me. But I really hope that going forward, Ashley is not allowed to bring her raggedy friend Deborah around to any more of these group events. She's obviously very thirsty and dehydrated and she's dying to get on this show by any means. It's embarrassing. But y'all, that was the episode. Next week is the finale and the way I'm going to rejoice when this season is done because I'm over it. I will not be reviewing Potomac after the season wraps. Unless we see some cast changes, that's the only way that I'll review it. But yeah, but again, that was my recap, y'all. I hope you guys enjoyed and you already know what to do. Please make sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and I will see you all later. Bye.